Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is acoustics pioneer John Stuart Reed. John is on a mission to educate and inspire the world about the field of cymatics, the science of visible vibrations and sound. He asserts that sound is the foundation of almost all matter in the universe and was a potent force in the creation of life in the primordial oceans, thereby carrying the power to heal life. His cymoscope invention has changed the world's perception of sound by giving us the ability to see sound and better understand this ubiquitous aspect of life. If you enjoy today's show, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. And now here is Paul discussing the sound of life with John Stuart Reed. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very special guest. John Stuart Reed, who is one of the world's leading experts in sound, cymatics, and the many applications of sound technology, including sound healing. And I've been wanting to do a podcast with John for a long time, and we've worked back and forth, and we made it happen. So today our topic is the sound of life. John, welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Paul. And I'm actually delighted to be with you and uh, to share with your listeners, you know, some little insights into 25 years of research that uh, this path that I've been on. Well, I'm super excited because, you know, you and I have been going back and forth and you've uh, been a great support for reviewing uh, key sections of my new book and uh, your insights are very valuable. And you shared a chapter that you wrote in a new book that I I don't know if it's published yet. Is the book that you wrote, the chapter that you shared with me published yet? No, it's not. That that book that you're referring to is the medical textbook. It's a new type of medical textbook. And I was uh, honored to write a chapter on it, uh, for it rather, in um, the subject of sound therapy and music medicine. It's coming out later this year. So looking forward to that. And it's going to be published not only in the English language, but also in Russian and Slovak. Excellent. Well, I read that chapter and and found it absolutely excellent. And you shared things about sound that I'd never studied anywhere before. And uh, as you know, I quoted you quite heavily in, in the chapter where I talk about the formative forces of the universe. And I'm really excited to be able to share some of your cymatic images and I won't I won't let the cat out of the bag because we'll talk about those a little bit later. But I think okay. the, the listeners will find that very fascinating and want to go to your website and check them out and maybe even buy some of your posters of those beautiful images. Well, I, I hope so, because, you know, it's we we are self-funded, Paul. And uh, yeah, we, <laughs> me too. <laughs> great. You know, and so any little purchases from our web store do really genuinely help to support the ongoing research. Well, not only that, in all fairness to you, they're extraordinary images, and I think they're very uplifting to the soul to see the beauty in nature that's, you know, what I would call extraterrestrial. Most people never think about the kinds of things you're sharing in those images, and I think it gives a person a chance to have a a transcendent experience to realize how much of the influences from outside of the domain of our sphere of our globe are really impacting us. Wow, that's that's quite a thought, Paul. Well, actually, you know, talking about these images, we call them cymoglyphs, just another word for sound image. And there is actually a science behind all of that that you're referring to, because these sound images, because they were created on the cymoscope instrument, by the way, that's spelled C-Y-M-A and then scope like microscope, because they were created on that instrument, which is scientifically calibrated, it means that they are literally models or analogs of the original sounds that created them, okay? So when you then take one of those images and print it out, say you go to a print shop or wherever, and you have it printed out large and put onto your wall in your home or your office, what happens is 
obviously the light that comes through your window or the incandescent light source that you might have in your room, that is unmodulated light, right? That is steady state light. And when that steady state light then uh, irradiates and illuminates the art, this cymaglyph, whatever it might be, mm. it suddenly becomes modulated. That light becomes modulated by the geometries that are in that image. And so the all of light obviously contains some degree of infrared spectrum. It's not all visible, of course. And the interesting thing about this is that the infrared spectrum, of course, deeply penetrates our tissues. Therefore, the geometries of these cymoglyphs modulates the light. The light becomes uh, carry, takes on basically the frequencies from that geometry, and then those frequencies deeply penetrate your body, not as sound, of course, but as modulations of infrared light. And it just so happens that all of the cells in our bodies are communicating primarily in the infrared spectrum. So literally, exactly, yeah. we are speaking the language of cells by this method. Yeah, I think the other component to that, too, is because the infrared penetrates the surface of the body, it actually impregnates the information from the cymoglyph right into the water of your body. And the water of your body has been shown by current research to interface with the information field we call mind. So you're actually taking those images, imprinting them into the water, and then they become part of your own mind. And that those images will have a very profound um, harmonizing effect on the human psychophysical construct. Wow, that's a great thought as well, Paul. And the other aspect to all of this is that it was um, Professor Gerald Pollack, of course, who yes, yeah. showed us that EZ water, exclusion zone water, which is present wherever you have a boundary condition. And of course, in every cell in our bodies, we have boundary conditions where the water in the cell, the liquid, actually meets the membrane. That's the boundary condition. And what uh, Professor Pollack showed us is that whenever water meets a membrane, then it creates what's called an exclusion zone. And these are negatively charged uh, particles. Well, basically, electricity <laughs> is created. And what he showed, one of the interesting aspects to his work was that he showed that infrared light actually helps to charge the cells with this electricity, with this negative charge at the boundary. Therefore, exactly what you're saying, you know, when infrared light penetrates into our tissues, what we're literally doing is charging up, almost like charging a battery. We yep. are giving, giving ourselves more energy, more electricity, you know? Yes. Have you ever by chance come across the work of the French physicist? Let me grab the book. Uh, Jean Charon. No, I've, I've heard of him, but not um, I haven't actually read his work. Okay, he's got two books. I'm holding one up to the screen right now. Can you can you oh, see yeah. that? I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in these two books, Gene Charon, who was a um, <clears throat> a fellow of Albert Einstein's, he worked directly with Einstein on multiple projects. Wow. He goes into he he got brave enough to share his metaphysical conception of the general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity and what that meant spiritually. And in his two books, he shows with mathematical equations and his own observations how electrons actually have the capacity for thinking and memory, and they record every single experience they've ever had and continue to do so indefinitely. Wow, that's a that's a very big statement and a very big thought, isn't it? Oh my god! It, it is, and it's really beautifully laid out, and it's it's very thorough. And he gets into the concepts of will, love, thought, knowledge, wisdom, and wow. a lot of spiritual correlations. But you know, the reason I bring that up is because we're talking about the flow of electrons, really, whether it yep. be anion, cation, positive, negative. Um, you know, electrons pretty much are involved in everything. Sure. And so it's a phenomenal couple of books because he really gives you an exploration of spirit.
from a quantum physics perspective and an atomic physics perspective. And it really shows you how consciousness goes all the way down to the level of the electron. And even sound is an electromagnetic phenomenon. So we, when we have these abilities to put the puzzle together, I think it makes the whole of creation a lot more uh, magical and a lot more interesting for people to engage in spiritual practices. Because the more you understand about how the universe interfaces with itself, which is us, and everything around us, you realize that we're, we're living inside of a consciousness generating, shall we call it, living organism or being, which most people think of as just a material dead thing, you know? I like your thinking, Paul. Actually, I've written, I've written down the, the name Jean Caron because I definitely would love to dig into his work. But one statement you made there, which I think we need to clarify for listeners, you mentioned that sound is an electromagnetic phenomenon. I'd just like to bring some clarity to that because, you know, what sound is really is, well, two things. First of all, passing on of vibratory data, you know, frequency data from one yeah. atom or one molecule to the other. So when they collide with each other, that information, that frequency information is passed on literally at the moment of their collision. So that's obviously kind of just a simple definition of sound. But the other aspect to this is that each of these, say, two atoms, for example, they have a magnetic field around each atom. It's called the magnetic, yeah. magnetic moment of each atom. Mm -hmm. and when the atoms collide in space, it's basically the, co the collision of the two magnetic fields. They're bouncing against each other and in so doing, passing on the vibratory information, as I mentioned. But the other thing that has to happen at that moment of collision is what's in general terms called friction, right? When we, yeah. when literally, when two surfaces meet each other, if I rub my hands together now, I can feel beautiful warmth. Why? Yeah. Because the, the, all the molecules in one hand are slipping past the molecules in the other hand. We call that friction, of course, as a common you know, everyday language. But in reality, what's happening is the trillions and trillions of atoms and molecules in one hand, the magnetic fields around those trillions and trillions of atoms and molecules are slipping past the trillions and trillions of atoms and molecules in your other hand. So it's all of these inelastic, what are called inelastic collisions between these magnetic fields that is actually generating the infrared that you then feel, we then feel as, as warmth, you know, as heat. So essentially, sound is the passing on of frequency data, vibrational data, but in the process, it always creates heat. It always creates, in other words, in this case, infrared light, you know, electromagnetism. So that's a, I hope that kind of clarifies basically what sound is. Yeah, and I think we'll get into that in a little bit when we talk about your sound bubble uh, explanation, which uh, I've put into the questions because I, I, you were the first person I've ever studied that explained sound that way. And I thought that really opened up a whole new vista for understanding sound. So um, once we get there, we can get into that and you can explain that. Sure. Um, from that perspective, because uh, as you know, we've got a lot to cover and I'm excited about all of it because I think, you know, sound is so fundamental to life and creati creativity and creation itself. That's really why I wanted to talk to you and, and help people have a, you know, a much more expanded perspective of sound on every level because our lives are so infused with sound that it, it's, 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 you know, taking sound out of life would be to take life out of life really at the end of the day. <laughs> Absolutely, Paul. I mean, if there was no sound, you'd have no heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's another interesting uh, thought because, of course, one of the aspects of my work, I don't think you've mentioned it in the questions that you're proposing today, but, you know, one of the interesting discoveries that Professor Sung Chul Ji and I made a couple of years ago is that our hearts actually have two primary functions. The, the one that obviously everyone knows about, you know, it's to circulate the blood around our bodies. 
But it turns out that there's a secondary function, and this secondary function is literally the sound of the heart. So yeah. you know, we all know that every heart has a has a beat, right? And you can yeah. put your ear against someone's chest, and you can hear that beautiful bass beat. But in terms of what that sound is doing, it was not known until we made our discovery a couple of years ago that what happens is that low frequency sound as it's pulsing through your circulatory system is actually causing the oxygen to be bound to bind to the hemoglobin molecules. And in fact, if you don't have a heartbeat, um, then, well, you know what's happened. You would, you would lose consciousness within seconds. Yeah, you know, That's very well known. But the reason, of course, is not so well known because it turns out that this pressure pulse of your heartbeat is actually critical for the uptake of oxygen by the hemoglobin molecules. No heartbeat, no uptake of oxygen, no no consciousness, basically. Well, you know, that, that brings up a point that, that maybe you can share your thoughts on if you have any. Um, and, and I'm going to jump in with this, even though it's not part of our outline, but I've got a lot of research on the infrared spectrum and how vast the frequencies that the body uses to connect to the environment and even to its own cells is. And we have hard data showing that electromagnetic pollution can basically oscillate the water molecules enough to change the temperature of the body and produce inflammation of the body. I'm wondering what your thoughts are, you know, and, and when I interviewed Z Dolph Zantinga, one of the world's leading experts on water, who's done extensive research on water, he showed that whenever water was exposed to 5G electromagnetic radiation, it destructured the water and produced what he called dead water, and it wouldn't carry information anymore. So I'm wondering, with that conception of sound as a, as a necessary component of oxygen delivery, what are your thoughts on the effects of 5G radiation going through those pathways and, and basically getting themselves involved in the infrared radiation spectrum? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the frequencies are wildly different. I mean, 5G is a much, much lower frequency than infrared. Also, the wavelengths, you know, of 3G, 4G, 5G, they're all massive con compared with the molecular. Uh, wavelengths that are going on in your body and biochemistry all of the time. So there's a very, very big mismatch between these kind of frequencies that we're talking about. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm in favor of, of 5G, by the way, you know, because I think, my God, we're already immersed in such a soup of electromagnetism that, you know, adding yet another <laughs> set of frequencies really you know, just intuitively, Paul, it can't be good for us. You know, I would right. say that. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying this from a point of view of being in favor of 5G. But what I do know is that the wavelengths, so-called wavelengths, <laughs> uh, it's a subject we can get into when we talk about sound bubbles and electromagnetic bubbles. But anyway, this, the, you know, using the conventional terminology, the wavelengths of 5G are massive in comparison with all of the chemistry going on in our bodies, uh, almost all of it. So I, you know, I kind of doubt that there's any real connection there. I mean, yeah, if you were standing right next to a or somewhere in the focal point of a 5G network mast, and your body was receiving, you know, massive field strength of 5G then I'd be very surprised if you were not affected by it, you know, simply because of the sheer amount of energy. You know, you can say the same thing, Paul, about any form of energy. It takes right. sunlight as an example, right? Good example. Mm -hmm. If you go and lie in the sun, depending on the height of the sun in the day and so on, and whether you've got a normal skin, you know, or you're very fair skin, but generally speaking, if you have <clears throat> normal skin, and you go and lie in the sun for, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that, then you will get great benefits from that sunlight on many, many levels, actually. Much of the chemistry in your body would love that energy. But if you lie in that, in that sun for half an hour or an hour or whatever, you're going to get badly burned. And yeah. the, same, the same is true 
of almost any form of energy. You can say the same about sound. You know, sound can be a, a beautiful, constructive way of healing the body, as I talk about in that chapter that you mentioned earlier. Music and all sorts of sound frequencies can be so healing. But if we up the amplitude, my God, you know, it becomes a, a destructive medium. And I think, you know, we can say the same about electromagnetism. Small doses, low field strength would do. Uh, I, I cannot see it doing any harm to a, a human organism. But if you are in a sufficient field strength, yes, definitely it will cause harm. Yeah, I think well, I think what I'm I'm leaning towards aside from that is is the fact that it just it destructures the water in the body and the blood is mostly water, as you know. Well, um, you know, you're saying it destructures. I would need to see those figures because, and I'd need to look at the evidence from the experiments. I wouldn't just you know automatically believe that. Um, I haven't done any of those experiments myself, so I don't necessarily decry the results. But I'm kind of a little bit skeptical about that. I'm kind of doubting it a bit. I think it, again, it depends on field strength. Did he use? you know, the kind of same field strengths that you would be picking up on your 5G phone, for example, or were they ramped up to 10 times that level? See what I mean? You yeah, know, you have to I, look at the evidence. Yeah, if I remember correctly from the interview, and what I'll do is I will actually um, connect the two of you by email because I think you'd find his research quite interesting and deep. And they were even using photon emission counters. He worked in Fritz Albert Pop's lab for a long wow. time. Great. For 12 years, he was the director of Fritz Albert Pop's research laboratory. My goodness. And, and uh, what I remember him saying is they simply put water, uh, water in a test tube next to a phone that was turned on. Yes. Yeah. If the phone is, if, if you're putting it right next to a phone, then sure, if the phone is a long way from the mast, then automatically the phone, you know, will put out its highest power output level. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you should never, ever put a phone on your ear because your ear is a straight path to your gray matter, obviously, you know, going literally through, through the ear auditory canal and direct into your brain. So you should never, ever do that, particularly, though, when the phone is a long way from a mast and the phone is struggling to connect. Therefore, it will automatically turn up the power. So it kind of doesn't surprise me that they received an effect or they experienced an effect with such close proximity to the phone. Yeah. And I think because people carry phones on their bodies all the time, be it in pockets, uh, clip, clip holders, um, you know, people are always carrying phones. I'm forever telling staff people that come around here not to carry phones in their pocket or put phones next to their food or their water, but they've got this habit that they don't realize is potentially challenging. Um, but I'll connect you to Dolph because I think the two of you had hit it off. He's a super, yeah. super smart guy. It's very kind of you. Thank you, Paul. And the other thing that I wanted to throw into the mix on this conversation is, is there's many step up and step down transform functions in the human body. So like you said, an energy source of any type can affect us at many levels. So even though the wavelengths may be longer, the fact that they're delivering energy into a, a body surrounded by fields, all the chakras, as you know, are, are energy transformers and energy information fields. So my, my thought is that the energy from 5G or other sources can actually have an effect on our physiology in ways that most people don't look at because they keep thinking of it strictly as the wavelength without looking into the step up, step down transformation capacities of our energy fields, our chakras, and even our cells. Yeah, it's a very, very complex issue. There's a saying I teach all of my students. The pain is seldom where the actual problem is. For example, I've seen many cases of rotator cuff problems that wouldn't heal even after surgery, but what most doctors and therapists overlook is that the right shoulder is under influence from the liver and the left shoulder the stomach. Once we apply the principles of detoxification, support digestion, and clear parasites, presto, shoulders start healing and working beautifully again. If you learn to see people holistically, like I teach my students in Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 1, you begin to see the true source of our illnesses and injuries. 
HLC-1 teaches you many essential approaches to health and well-being, such as how to assess what key body systems are under too much stress and how to restore balance, the importance of identifying a realistic dream goal or objective that inspires each individual to stick to their healing program and make the short and long-term changes that are necessary, my universally applicable 1234 formula for assessing and correcting challenges, how to breathe optimally to enhance energy levels and mental clarity, how to use gentle movements to work in and enhance life force energy and support optimal immune function, how the function and health of the soil that food is grown in influences all systems of the body, including our mental emotional stability and much more. HLC-1 is just a small part of what we teach our Czech Academy students, our education system for elite trainers and health professionals. Gavin Jennings and I designed the academy to take you from wherever you are right now, even if you have no fitness or health education, to being one of the best holistic health and performance professionals on this planet. And as a Czech Academy student, you'll be able to help a lot of people reach their health goals in ways you never imagined. There is, in my opinion, nothing more rewarding and meaningful in life than helping other people look, feel, and live better. We are now accepting applications into the Czech Academy, so whether you're wanting to change your career or add a truly effective new dimension to your current skill set, now is the time to apply. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy. Let's make the world a better place together. I know someone who lives in Florida. He had to move away from the home that he was living in because it was so close to one of these masts. And I think at the time it would just be a 4G mast. Um, and he talked to me, you know, about the idea of making his home into a Faraday cage, literally aligning all the walls, you know, with uh, conductive material and, and grounding that and so on. But in the end, he didn't do any of that. He just moved away. But he he actually was one of these people, Paul, who, like you were saying, you know, some people are very sensitive to electromagnetism. And he was one of them for sure. And they ended up literally having to move house. <laughs> Yeah, I had a client who had a penthouse in Manhattan, and he was beginning to report. He had moved into it, and shortly thereafter, began to report a lot of health symptom uh, challenges between him, his wife, and his kids. Mm. And I immediately recognized them as symptoms of electromagnetic radiation pollution. Yes. And I said, you need to look around your area and see if you can see any cell phone towers. And lo and behold, he got a hold of me very quickly and said, you're not going to believe it. He was standing on his his outdoor patio on the top of the building, and directly across the street was a cell phone tower. Oh, my God. So we get, had him get a, 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 they're called bow biologists. They do all sorts of specialized readings to test for stuff like that. Turned out he had 26,000 times the safe limit of uh, <laughs> cell phone radiation going through wow. his house. And he spent almost a million dollars having his house painted with uh, lead paint and other stuff to block the radiation. Um, but he ultimately ended up selling it um, just because it wasn't a place that he felt his family could could be healthy. Yeah, I mean, the window, you, you can't control the windows. Obviously, the no. electromagnetism would go straight through. And and so, yeah, I can understand why you would have to move in the end, for sure. Yeah, well, these are just little side conversations that I think are very interesting. And I love having them with people like you that have enough depth of knowledge to, to unpack them a bit. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. I, I'd love it if if we could get a little bit of background information on how you got so deeply involved in sound cymatics and the related research sure. that you're doing. Yeah. I, I think it's fascinating. You know, I, I read enough on your website to, to have some insights into it, but I'd love it if you could share with the listeners so they can kind of get a sense from how the sound genius got created. <laughs> Thank you for calling me a genius. Huh? But anyway, I, I, it's my story really starts as a child, Paul, because so it's natural, you know, that I'm I'm definitely someone who resonates, let's say, with sound. And I always have, even from being a child. So for my third birthday, for example, my parents bought me a, a one of these spinning tops that you press the lever on the top and it creates this beautiful two-tone chord. And I absolutely loved it. And I played and I played and I played with that spinning top. 
so much that in the end, you know, I just ended up breaking it. But, <laughs> but you know, from there, I can remember even as a five-year-old playing with little glass jars on the table filled with water and striking them with a, a spoon or something, <clears throat> making beautiful sounds. So, you know, obviously I've been... Uh, I'm natural at this, you know, I've been entranced by sound my whole life. So, you know, after college and university, um, I went literally into my own acoustics business. So I founded an acoustics consultancy business and I ran that business for 30 straight years. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, pretty standard stuff, really, in acoustics. But going right back to when I was a teenager, I actually wanted to be a scientist. I didn't really want to be an engineer, but it was my dad who convinced me that engineering would provide me with the, the background knowledge. And my God, has he been proven to be correct? Because now, you know, I'm actually an acoustic physics scientist and all of the engineering years that I spent have been so valuable. So, so basically what happened for me was I'd been an acoustics engineer for something like about 25 years when my daddy and I were traveling in Egypt and found ourselves alone just by happenstance in the Great Pyramid at Cairo, Giza. And um, it was a really lucky accident because usually, you know, <laughs> if you go into the Great Pyramid, you're surrounded by tourists, of course, because it's such a popular destination. Anyway, in this particular case, uh, because I was an acoustics engineer, obviously I was interested in the amazing acoustic in that king's chamber. I mean, it's lined with granite. Uh, Aswan granite is a kind of pinkish hue. It's also one of the interesting aspects to Aswan granite is it has a very high quartz content. So around about 20% of the material in the matrix is actually quartz. And you can see the crystals. You know, they're, they're not micro crystals. They're actually large crystals. You can just see them with the unaided eye. Anyway, I, what I wanted to do was to lie in the sarcophagus, which is a, a, a basically a box of granite, 3.7 tons. It's been obviously started life as a, a piece of bedrock. It was then created as a monolithic block. Then it was hollowed out using tubular drills, by the way, and you can still see the evidence on one of the walls where they hollowed it out, you know, it, it, using tubular drills. But anyway, I wanted to lie in it. Why? Because it's extraordinarily resonant, that box. You know, if you strike the side of it with your fist, Paul, it rings like a low-pitched bell. And the sound of those, you know, that, that radiates off from striking with your fist is not a pure sound. It's actually quite a complex sound, just as a bell would be, except yeah. in this case, it's very, very low pitched, you know, so it's got, in other words, it's got harmonic content. It's not just a pure single frequency that's resonating at. So naturally, I wanted to lie in it. It's a little bit naughty, you know, but a lot of people have done it before me, and I'm sure that many others will after me. I lay in it, and what I did was simply perform a vocal glissando so this is a kind of, you know, unstepped enunciation of a single tone. And the purpose behind that was to establish roughly what is the resonant frequency of that sarcophagus. Now, the reason we, you know, we use this term resonant frequency, resonance is only really relating to something that moves. So you can't say that a room has a resonant property. Why? Because the walls of the room don't actually move, you know, if they're, well, not usually anyway, and certainly not in the king's chamber because the right. walls are massively heavy. I mean, they're these giant blocks of granite, so they don't move, not, not with the kind of sound levels that we can create anyway. So they don't resonate, but the sarcophagus, yes, because it has relatively slim walls and they do literally flex with sound. So we can say gen genuinely, that that is a resonant property of this particular, in this case, sarcophagus. So anyway, at one particular pitch, just lying there, making this vocal glissando with my daddy standing over me, looking at me with a kind of puzzled expression on his face, um, one particular pitch, it felt like every cell in my body was tingling and, and goosebumps actually broke out all over my flesh. And oh my goodness, it felt 
really very, very strange indeed. And so what I did was I took my pitch up a little bit beyond this, what I've come to call the Goldilocks note, you know, after Goldilocks and the Three Bears story. Uh-huh. Anyway, I took my pitch just above this uh, this point where I was tingling. And then obviously, well, not obviously, but the effect stopped. And then if yeah. I brought my pitch down below this particular pitch, again, the effect stopped. And it turned out, to cut a very long story short, that this particular pitch is 117 hertz. Now, I couldn't identify it at that moment in time. Obviously, I didn't have any instrumentation with me. But I did go back later the same year with instrumentation, and that's when I you know, was able to actually measure this pitch or this frequency as it is, uh, 117 hertz. The other interesting thing about this, uh, Paul, is that that same year when I went back with instrumentation, it turned out that the chamber as a whole has a primary mode of 121 hertz. Now, 121 and 117 are obviously very close numbers. And it turns out, if you're standing in the king's chamber and you make a, a, vo a vocal tone at 121 hertz, then nearly all of that acoustic energy ends up in the sarcophagus. In other words, they are acoustically coupled together, you know, so the energy will naturally uh, migrate into, you know, that particular box of, of granite. So and it turned out that, you know, my thinking about all of this was that this was not this effect that I was having in my body, you know, the tingling and the goosebumps and everything. It felt like it was designed, Paul. It didn't feel to me at that time that this was any kind of accident, you know. So it felt like design. And that's why I went back the same year I got gained permission from the Egyptian Antiquities Department to go back and to conduct a whole series of standard acoustics experiments. And, and they were very successful experiments, you know, but nothing kind of life-changing, I wouldn't say. But one of the experiments that I wanted to conduct and, and could not that particular year simply because there wasn't time, um, I wanted to conduct a cymatics experiment. Now, cymatics is essentially the science of visible sound. And it simply means that whenever sound is present, And whenever there's a membrane present, whatever that membrane would look like, doesn't matter, there has to be uh, an interaction between the sound and the membrane. And this interaction creates a geometric, usually a geometric pattern on the surface of that membrane. Now, the membrane can be, you know, if you've heard of Cladney plates, they're, they're literally yeah. mm -hmm. brass plates or glass plates. You know, you don't think of a brass plate as being something that would flex like a membrane, but indeed it does. So yeah. even very dense, solid surfaces, depending on their mass, can flex. Uh, the skin on your body will, will be showing cymatic patterns all of the time, but you just can't see them because they're obviously uh, invisible to the unaided eye. In this case, though, you know, regarding the sarcophagus, Because it was so extraordinarily resonant, and because I'd found such amazing results with my 1996 experiments, you know, just standard acoustics experiments, I thought, you know, I would love to see these resonances. I'd love to have them made visible. So that's why I gained permission again, and this time went back in 1997 to conduct these particular cymatics experiments with the sarcophagus. But what happened for me, Paul, was that three weeks before going out to Egypt in 97, I quite badly injured my lower back and, and I was in a lot of pain, so much so that at one point I thought, I'll have to cancel this mission. I don't see how I can possibly, you know, conduct these experiments when I'm in so much pain. You know, when you're in so much pain that you just can't think straight? Yeah. I, I'd spent a lot of money, obviously, you know, gaining, gaining these permissions to go out. I'd also, you know, bought a lot of additional equipment and so on. But even so, I just couldn't face the idea of, of doing anything in this level of pain. In the end, I, I just took probably way too many analgesics than I should have, it would have good for me. <laughs> and I gritted my teeth and somehow I managed to get myself into the Great Pyramid. Other people carried in the equipment. You know, I couldn't, I carried in a camera and that was about the most that I could carry in. Anyway, again, cutting the long story short, 
the whole idea of this experiment, as I mentioned, was to uh, see the resonances in the sarcophagus, make them visible. So to do that, those of you who've been in the Great Pyramid and seen the sarcophagus, you will know that one side of it, um, what is it, the west side is slightly higher than the east side. At some point, it's been broken away by, well, who knows, and I don't know. But what I had to do was to literally repair it first to level the top. So I already knew in advance, of course, what was needed in terms of materials to do that. So I took along quite a lot of different materials like uh, styrofoam, gaffer tape. I even had a an aluminum corner specially made to fix the broken away corner, you know. So I basically carefully leveled the whole of the top of the sarcophagus. Then I stretched across a PVC membrane, weighted around the perimeter with 43 little bags of sand, each one carefully measured to have the same weight of sand in it. And all the sand, by the way, was collected outside the pyramid, you know, because it got loads of sand in Egypt. They got no shortage of sand. Yeah. Anyway, so so this was the kind of, and then inst instead of me lying in the sarcophagus this time, it, I placed a small speaker there to make the sound, obviously. And um, and so that was the essence of the of this experiment. Sprinkled on sand, then on the surface of the membrane, switched on the oscillator, this electronic oscillator to make pure tones into the speaker and then obviously watch what would happen next you see now with cymatics certainly with particulate matter cymatics like we were using in this case sand as the revealing medium um, what what we normally do is very carefully monitor the sand grains as we adjust the frequency just tweak it just a little bit and then if you see the sand some of the sand grains just starting to jump a little bit, then you just play with the frequency a little bit up, a little bit down to see if you can maximize that little bit of jumping of the sand grains. And then once you see where that maximal point is, that's the point where you then begin to slowly increase the amplitude, in other words, the volume in this case, coming yeah. out of the speaker. And then what happened was so dramatic and so incredible which was that an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph appeared in the membrane, now, on the membrane. And <laughs> it was like one of those never, you could never ever forget a moment like that in, you know, in your life. I mean, at this particular, I was, I, I'm sure my mouth must have dropped wide open. This thing, this was actually the uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for the, the jed pillar, the the, basically ah. the backbone of the god Osiris is what it was. And it wasn't static, Paul. This thing was snaking like a like a vertebra, you know, of a human that was it had a beautiful dynamic to it. And at this point, the antiquities inspector who had been standing across quite a few, quite a few feet away, actually, standing with his back against the north wall. And I can still see a picture of him in my mind's eye. He was filing his nails, and he was looking across at me, very bored, and thinking, you know, this Englishman is clearly barking mad. You know, <laughs> but, but, you know, he probably was thinking, it doesn't matter to me. I, you know, he's paid me a lot of backsheesh, a lot of money, you know, to do these experiments. And so I, I'm, I'm sure these were the kind of thoughts that were going through his mind. But now, seeing this, you know, amazing hieroglyph appear, he ran across, uh, dropping his nail file as he went, and and suddenly just stood there with his eyes popping, you know, like organ stops, <laughs> and his mouth ha hanging open. And he and then he said to me, "How you do that? How you do that?" And I just literally had to shrug my shoulders in the moment. I didn't know. I didn't expect anything like that. What I had expected was I thought I would be seeing a series of geometric patterns that I would later analyze in the lab, you know, in, a, in the same way that I would analyze any normal cymoglyph, any kind of normal sound image. But this was not a normal sound image. This was not a cymoglyph. This was a hieroglyph, you know. Yeah. So now we, we, we were both excited, of course. And then he wanted, to, he wanted to help. Oh, how can I help you? What can I do? So then I instructed him what to do. So he would scrape off the 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 sand off the membrane, I would sprinkle on fresh sand because this is the process that, you know, each time you change the frequency. 
sprinkle on fresh sand, start the oscillator again at a slightly different, slightly higher frequency this time, and lo and behold, another ancient Egyptian hieroglyph appeared, you know, and this process went on for about 20 minutes, I, and I have to say, it wasn't every single frequency that created a hieroglyph. Some of the images between the hieroglyphs were what I would term coral seas, or very strange alien-like landscapes, you know, that appeared, and then change the frequency again, and then another hieroglyph would appear, and so on. Anyway, after about 20 minutes of this, and obviously very excited, of course, who wouldn't be, you know, seeing these ancient yeah. hieroglyphs. After about 20 minutes, I suddenly realized, because I was bending low to, to, to look at the little sand grains jumping, as I was explaining there, and I suddenly realized, hey, there's no pain in my back. My back is completely, you know, pain-free. And, uh -oh. and, and I thought, wow, in, this, in that moment, Paul, I thought, ah, I know what this is. My bloodstream is flowing with endorphins. I'm ex so excited, obviously, but what I'm seeing, and I thought, you know, this is simply masking the pain. And when I get back outside the pyramid, the pain will come back. But actually, the, po the pain never did come back. In fact, I was in so, I, I, I felt so healthy um, when the experiment finished that I was able to actually carry out some of the equipment. You know, other people carried out some, I carried out some. But I felt so healthy, so vibrantly healthy. And the pain, like I say, the pain never came back. So, so two things, Paul, you know, came out of that, of that amazing experiment. The first was clearly there was a mechanism by which my lower back had been healed. When no amount of painkillers, I had even visited a physiotherapist, nothing had touched that pain. But 20 minutes of sound in the king's chamber only th those first 20 minutes made the pain go away. I mean, the, the whole session lasted three hours, but within 20 minutes, no pain, right? And then mm -hmm. the other thing, the other thing, Paul, was that the, the cymatics experiment had been so phenomenally successful. It said to me that this must be a new tool, potentially a new tool for science. And indeed, that's, you know, we're, we're talking 1997. This is literally... 25 years ago, and, and in those 25 years, my main research has been first developing the cymoscope instrument that we have today, a new tool for science, and then second, how did my lower back, how was my lower back healed when no amount of analgesics or physiotherapists could fix it, but sound fixed it in 20 minutes. So now, you know, that's the journey that I've been on these last 25 years and now we have the instrument, and now I know many of the answers to the biological uh, effects of sound on our physiology. Yeah, what, that's an amazing story. And, and, you know, I read on your website, I think you have a, a quite a comprehensive article showing even the uh, one or two of the uh, glyphs or images or hieroglyphs that were produced from the sound. Indeed. And I, I found that fascinating. I read that word by word and I thought, wow, wow when I talk to John, I'm going to have to get him to share this story because it's so profound. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it, but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable 
turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15, to save 15%. A couple of thoughts come to my mind. One, isn't the JED used, uh, its intentional purpose is a power source and also From my studies, I've got several books called Path Technology that are written by a group of Africans that explain this ancient technology and describe how what people think of as Egyptian technology actually came out of Africa. And they break all these instruments and tools, the onk, the jed, and many things down and and show how they work. And they talked about the jed being coupled with the onk as a means of, of moving into other dimensions. Wow, um, I haven't heard that, but you know the the jet as a symbol certainly goes way way back in Egyptian history. I don't know that it goes to pre-dynastic times, but it's certainly very very ancient. Usually there are um four crossbars, but occasionally, very occasionally there are five. And I know that, you know, from for example, there was one author d- thought that the relieving chambers, so-called, I should say, relieving chambers above the king's chamber, where there are five segments to those relieving chambers, that um, this author believed that it may be symbolizing the jed pillar, basically, in other words, creating a kind of model of of the backbone of the god Osiris in the king's chamber. And that's a, it's a real a real possibility. It certainly was a, a symbol of power. There's no question about that. But as to, did you say time travel, Paul? Uh, dimension shifts. You oh, know that- how uh, UFOs have been cited as just suddenly appearing and then disappearing or, or being in the sky and all of a sudden instantly appearing somewhere else in the sky, like an like yeah. electron jump. Yes, yes. Well, who knows? For sure, it's a, it's uh, it's quite a thought. Um, I had a, a friend actually called Bill Kay, a very good friend who was a, um, a radio broadcast engineer actually, and uh, he had this absolutely amazing uh, model of the king's chamber and all of the other uh, passages and apartments, as they're called, you know, in the Great Pyramid. And in his case, because he was a radio engineer. And particularly into the microwave technology at the time, he's no longer with us. I think I mentioned that. But anyway, uh, Bill, saw, what he saw in the, the apartments of the Great Pyramid was a model of a microwave receiver uh, literally created in stone. And he had this amazing hypothesis that at one time in our distant past, uh, Egypt had been visited by extraterrestrials. And they had, whether either accidentally or deliberately, who knows, left behind an uplink antenna. This was a this would be a microwave antenna uh, uplink to the mother craft, you know, up in in space, and um, and it'd been accidentally left behind when they finally departed the Earth. And the Egyptians had revered this uplink antenna and did what the only thing that they could do with their technology of the day, which was to recreate it in stone. And so they had therefore created, you know, all of these apartments in the Great Pyramid to model effectively these components. And he showed me the drawings. And I have to say, they were very, very persuasive. I mean, all of the components, like, for example, you know, the the Grand Gallery, no one's ever really, you know, got to grips with what the Grand Gallery represents. But symbolically, and at least in terms of this model of Bill Kay's, it was actually a, a waveguide, you know, in, in the in this model that he created. I'm not going into all the details now, but suffice to say, you know, that we are. It's very easy to be persuaded when we see things. You know, we all have our own filters, don't we? In yeah. Bill, Bill Kay's case, you know, he because he was a radio engineer, his filters showed him radio components, you know, and who, who knows, he might actually be correct. You know, we, we can't say, but I know we all have our own theories about ancient Egyptian uh, technology. It's, it's a, f- a fabulous subject. 
Yeah, you know, what I'm going to do for you, John, I'm going to get the names of this series of books by this African group called Path Technology, Thank and I'm going to forward you those details. They're, they're excellent books, and they go into almost everything you've just talked about. Wow. And, and they show how every invention uh, attributed to, to Volta, Tesla, uh, uh, Eddington, uh, not Eddington, um, what's the guy that invented Edison. the light bulb? Edison. Edison. All of those were uh, African technologies that wow. ultimately ended up in Egypt and were stolen and then attributed to these inventors. And they show the history of it. And they show all the electronics, where, you know, capacitors are, everything. I mean, it, oh, it's interesting. very well done. And I think with what you've just shown me, if you look at those books, and then think of what your friend, the uh, the radio engineer, showed yeah, you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to start making some dots bounce around in your well, head and start connecting. You, well, I I know that I know that uh, Bill Kay's wife Audrey would you know she would love it if if it was if it turned out that Bill was right all along you know so yeah um, yeah for sure that that brings up the 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 you know you've beautifully woven in my second question in in our dialogue uh schedule here today you know you're talking about specialized drills and you're talking about a level of technology that goes completely against what universities teach about human beings 12,000 years ago and the concept of pyramids being built by rolling 100 ton blocks of stone on wooden rollers and things like that. Now I'm a guy that lifts stones all the time yep. and teaches stone lifting and I can tell you blocks that big would crush anything except maybe ironwood. And so where do you sit on how on earth something with that level of technology was built that long ago? I'm curious as to your thoughts as to whether that's human or whether we have, um, shall we say, guests from other dimensions coming to create harmonic resonators and balancers on this planet for various reasons. I hear where you're coming from, Paul. Well, you know, my daddy and I actually traveled in Egypt many, many, many times. And so we were, you know, we were great uh, fans of the ancient Egyptian engineers. We really did study them in depth. And a lot of people have come up with a lot of theories about the ancient Egyptians having high technology. My own thoughts on that, you know, having spent countless hours studying the pyramids, for example, right up close and personal, you know, looking at how they laid the blocks. If you, if you stand there for hours, as we did, and study the different courses. You know, now that the casing blocks have been removed, sort of thing, you can see the core blocks, can't you? And and you can see the the kind of mindset that that the Egyptians had, the engineers of the day. They would have a supervisor whose whose job it was to obviously move blocks into position. There would be days when they, they were trying to desperately finish a course. And um, maybe they they were lacking blocks for you know to fill a particular space. So you can see areas like that where they they would say, "Oh, look, guys, let's just put two smaller blocks here or three smaller blocks to fill this gap." You know, you can kind of almost get into their mindset just to stand and look at these blocks. So the way it seems to me, the only puzzle that I have in terms of how these pyramids were built comes in when we talk about the pyramidian, you know, the right at the very top of the pyramid. That is a real puzzle piece for me. But the rest of the pyramid, well, it just takes a heck of a lot of manpower for sure. These blocks, and oh, by the way, you know, other, other people have said that the blocks were, were not, not quarried, that they were poured. Now, again, I have seen evidence with my own eyes of blocks that were poured. In other words, again, See, trying to get into the mindset of these people, these engineers. If a day came when they were short of a, of a block to fill a space, they would literally create a concrete block. And I've seen them with my own eyes where the, the face of the block has bellied out just as it would if the, you know, if the wooden shuttering couldn't hold the weight of the, of the concrete that they had made that day. So I know that there are some blocks for sure that were poured in that way. But equally, 
my daddy and I, we studied them really close, up and personal, like going underneath the blocks, looking underneath a block to see the chisel marks because clearly the weathering on the face of the blocks has completely erased all, you know, all evidence of chiseling. But if you look underneath the blocks, Paul, you will see the chisel marks literally where they have chiseled these, you know, limestone blocks. So, you know, from my perspective, I don't have any problem in believing that they used ramps of some kind, whether they were one big long ramp, you know, that they kept increasing in amplitude or height rather, or whether they were wrap around ramps, we will obviously never know because you can't go back in time to see how they did it. But for sure, you know, my own sense of it is that they did use some system of ramps. However, that does not solve the problem of the pyramidion. Once you get up really high, there's no way to create a ramp, right? You just can't do it. And especially no, no. when you're dealing with stones that weigh like two and three tons, and even the pyramidian stone itself, you know, the very, very topmost stone that, that's shaped like a pyramid, as it were, that goes right on the top. You know, a stone like that, two or two and a half tons, how the heck do you get up there? They didn't have cranes that we know of. It's just a big mystery, Paul. And, you know, everybody loves a mystery. I'm no, I'm no different to everyone else. Yeah. But where I'm coming from, is in, in essence, to answer your question, is that I don't have a need for the f to believe that they had high technologies. I have great respect for their engineering abilities. I've seen things that are just absolutely awe-inspiring. Like, for example... Uh, the, the statue of Kefren in the in the Cairo Museum. This is where Kefren is, is seated. Uh, the stone is nice, you know, spelled G N E I S S, nice, or usually just pronounced nice. It's a very very hard stone. I have been to the quarry where the nice stone was literally quarried. It's an incredibly hard, dense stone, and here we are told by Egyptologists. Um, that they didn't have iron in that era, in the fourth dynasty. Wow. Okay. Well, how are you going to carve a statue of such exquisite beauty as that statue of Kefren? It's the one with the, the Horus bird, you know, on his nemes, on his headdress, looking as if the, the bird's actually kind of impregnating his headdress. But it's an exquisitely carved statue. Um, how are you going to do that without iron? You know, and and it's well, it's just impossible, basically, because what the Egyptologists are saying is that copper was the only stone available, or oh, sorry, only metal available in the old kingdom. Absolutely too nonsense. soft nonsense. You just cannot carve with with copper. It's just impossible. It just turns its nose up. Yes, copper is a very very tough metal. Actually, you know, people call it soft. Well, it is kind of soft, but it's also incredibly tough. But still, when you offer it up to a really hard, dense stone, um, it just turns its nose up. You know, you can't carve anything. And, and certainly the kind of levels of detail that you see in that Kefren statue, wow. I mean, it is a, an exquisite work of art, which would, would challenge any sculptor today. In fact, sculptors today don't work in these hard stones. It's just too difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got great respect uh, for, for the Egyptian craftsmen. They were superb. But I don't believe that we need to attribute high technologies to them. Well, you know, the thought that comes up, I mean, I could rattle on on this forever because I've studied this quite a bit myself and so I won't hold this up too much because there's so many other amazing things I want to have you share. But, you, you know, you talk about the sarcophagus being cut with a, you know, a tubular drill. Well, you have to say, well, how the hell did they power a drill like that? Because a hand drill would take 100 years to grind a stone like that. I agree with you, Paul. And I, I don't believe they did do it by hand. I mean, I've seen um, there's a, a actual there's a place called Tuna El Gabel where there's literally a scene, but this is in Greco-Roman times, but there's literally a scene on the walls showing a, um, a kind of hand, a hand tubular drill system. But I don't believe in this case, when they're hollowing out a block that size, that they would have used you know, any kind of hand-driven bow drill. My own sense of this is, from an engineering perspective, they would have used an animal and a capstan. 
So it would be quite a simple, um, you know, that we, we know for sure that they use capstans for, for raising water, for example. So in this case, using a, an animal, you know, maybe an oxen or, I don't know, donkeys or whatever to, to, to drive a capstan round and round, and then that capstan would be rope driven, rope connected to a drilling system. And there's some evidence actually for this. And I, I think uh, your listeners are going to be really interested in this aspect because they're in the Petrie Museum in London. It's a very small museum. But one of the objects, uh, this is, by the way, uh, Flinders Petrie was the famous Egyptologist. And uh, one of the objects in there is a granite cylinder that he found in just a rubbish heap, basically, at Giza. And what you find if you study this granite cylinder very closely, it looks very, very like an Edison phonograph cylinder, okay? So it's kind of, it's about the same dimensions as an Edison phonograph cylinder. And it's also tapered from one end to the other, like an Edison phonograph cylinder. But one of the interesting features, Paul, of this cylinder, if you study it closely, you find that there's um, helical grooves on it that go round and round and round. I think one of them has about 12 different turns, right? Uh, continuous, unbroken, right? Now, somebody wrote that this meant that they had incredible uh, drilling prowess, that they could literally, you know, drill into a hard stone uh, as if it was going into butter. Well, my theory is the exact opposite to that. What they were doing was extracting this drill while it was still turning. Now, why, yeah. would, why would they do that? The reason is because you don't want to stop your animal. So your animal is just continuing to walk round and round and round, right? The drill is continuing to turn. But what happens, because I've done my own, conducted my own uh, drilling experiments with tubular drills and granite, and what happens is, that as you, you feed in some kind of cutting agent like emery, for example, you know, to help the copper tubular drill to do its cutting job. Well, what happens is you get a buildup of powder on the surface of the cutting edge, if you like, of the copper tubular drill. And this stops the cutting process. So what you have to do is remove the drill and then slosh in some water to basically clean out the dust. And then you move the drill back in and allow it to continue doing its cutting with a cutting agent. So I think what was happening here was, okay, there's some little bit of grit or something got caught in the gap between the drill and the block that they were you know, drilling into. And this little hard bit of grit, it might have been a bit of corundum, a bit of emery or something, as they, as they were extracting the drill by some form of a lever system, the animal was still turning the drill and therefore created this tubular, sorry, this spiral groove of several turns as they removed it, right? Now, one of the one of the interest, very interesting aspects to this whole story, Paul, I'm sure that you and your listeners are going to find absolutely fascinating, is that I had taken some photographs of this tubular drill in the Petri Museum, right? They ended up in a book called Giza, the Truth. I, I received this after this book was published. This is many, many years ago. I received a, a phone call from a, a, a scientist who said, I've just seen your, um, your cylinder photo in Giza, the, the book called Giza, the Truth. Um, uh, do you not think it looks like an Edison phonograph cylinder? I said, well, yes, of course it does. You know, I said, but that's just pure coincidence. It's not that they were, you know, the ancient Egyptians were not trying to create an Edison phonograph all these thousands of years ago. He says, oh, of course not. That's a silly thought. He said, but, but wouldn't those grooves that you're showing on this, uh, on this wonderful photograph, wouldn't they contain acoustic data, acoustic information, just like the Edison phonograph? And suddenly, you know, I nearly dropped the phone because I realized that what this guy was saying was actually true, that, you know, that whatever this little piece of grit was, that it caused this beautifully scored um, spiral groove could indeed contain acoustic data, you know, like literally like a, an audio recording, just as you would have on an Edison phonograph cylinder or on, a you know, one of the old kind of 78 records of yesteryear sort of thing. 
So this is an intriguing possibility, Paul, you know, that you could have some guy, for example, at the at the workplace where they've, they've got this beast, you know, turning this capstan and um, and some guy is shouting, you know, get on with your work or, you know, whatever. And, and it ends up as the oldest recording in history. If that, <laughs> you know, if that cylinder was ever, you know, if they ever applied a, um, a, a system of transcription, because you can, you know, you can laser scan things these days. You know, you don't need to literally use a, a stylus or anything. It can be laser scanned. Oh, gosh, that would be such a moment in history, wouldn't it? You know, to hear a, literally an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian voice, even if it was some shouted curse, you know, it would still be, it would make yeah. world history, wouldn't it? It would. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've heard me talk about the many injuries I've had doing many wild things from racing motocross to riding in the rodeo and crashing stock cars and being a paratrooper. And one of the things that's really helped me a lot to make my joints more comfortable and heal is collagen. And Bioptimizers has just come out with an amazing new product called Collagenius that actually goes way beyond anything we can get in the standard collagen supplementation classification. And I've got Mark Effinger here, who's the chief product officer at Bioptimizers, to tell us about their new product, which I'm very excited about. Mark. Tell us what's unique about Collagenius. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I, and I really appreciate this, by the way. So Collagenius came about um, as an accident of my lab assistant trying to compartmentalize different mushroom extracts from one to one all the way to 100 to one. These are all medicinal mushrooms and they're all organic. And we were finding this really interesting overtone of chocolate and cacao coming out of these mushroom extracts. And the more extraction we got, the further we got down the extraction lane, the higher the, the chocolate notes would come out of these. So me being a, a, a more of a scientist, I was trying to cap these things. She being more of an incredible chef decided that what if we could flavor these up and us both being over 50 and me having some of the same experiences you have in breaking bones and tearing muscles and tendons <laughs> decided, wouldn't it be great if we could we could take the, the benefits of collagen and the restorative and, and tissue repair and combine it with these micronutrients that are available in mushrooms that activate the collagen and make it bioavailable. So we started blending those things up. And as a result, we came up with this nootropic, this brain enhancing mushroom stack that is also a super collagen enhancer. And those together became Collagenius. That's so amazing. I just love the exploration. I love the marriage of your wife's chef skills and your science skills. And that's just the magic of a healthy relationship. And that really describes my relationship with Bioptimizers, just magical because I love all their products. I, I've always had a great relationship with Wade and I love it because everything Bioptimizers sells actually works. What a concept. So, hey, you guys get your Collagenius at N-O-O-T-O-P-I-A, that's newtopia.com forward slash living number four and the letter D. That's newtopia.com forward slash living 4D. And get your discount with Paul 10 on checkout. I can't wait to hear what you think about Collagenius. Enjoy. The last thing I want to bring up is I've seen uh, Greg Braden and many other uh, experts in evaluations of pyramids and various sciences bring up a point repeatedly that uh, I will put on the table here. And that is there are inlaid cuts of the symbol of the flower of life in several different places in different pyramids that have been analyzed and shown to have the precision of a CNC milling machine. That's even after all these years, there's those flower of life patterns are still so perfect that the conclusion is it's utterly impossible for that to have been done by any hand or art, 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 artistic craftsman because the perfection of the geometry could only be reproduced by one of our high quality CNC milling machines. So how do you get stuff like that in pyramids from that period of time using concepts like animals driving drills. It just leaves me at a dead end. Okay, I hear what you're saying, Paul, and it is certainly intriguing. But on the other hand, who's to say, you know, when these flower of life uh, 
ge geometric patterns were incised into the stone. You know, there's no yeah. way to know, is there? I mean, it could have happened 100 no. years ago, and, and, and somebody did it then, and, and, and then we are attributing it to the ancient Egyptians. There's no way to know. So I, I, I take that with a pinch of salt, actually, unfortunately. I mean, I'm a, you know, I am, I am a scientist, and I look for evidence. Yeah. I'm also, you know, I'm not silly. You know, I look for what is reasonable. And to me, that doesn't sound reasonable. And certainly not having studied Egyptology for many, many years, I'm certainly, I wouldn't consider myself to be, you know, a professional Egyptologist by any means. But I have quite a lot of knowledge of Egyptology. And I, I have studied uh, aspects of their, uh, their craftsmanship, you know, very deeply. And I just, you know, I find that a big, big struggle, actually, to believe that they had anything like the kind of technology that's being attributed to them there with CNC machines. I don't, I just don't buy that at all. Sorry. Well, yeah, I think what they're saying is whatever did it had to have that level of precision. And they also have done dating on these things because they obviously had the same suspicion that you just raised. But you uh, can't date a stone, though. You know, I've seen one of these. I've seen one of these uh, symbols of the flower of life at uh, the Osirian, for example, in Egypt. I've seen it, you know, with my own eyes, and I, uh, and I do realize, you know, that it would. It, it certainly is beautifully created, but you know, you can't you can't date the stone itself. You can't date when it was incised. Um, no, I, I I I just don't buy it. Yeah, well, it's there's just so many mysteries, but uh, true. <laughs> it, yeah, I just think it, you know because you've got all this experience, I'm bringing these things up because they they leave some very large question marks. That I oh think yeah, and we all love mysteries, you know for sure. And I I yeah. have you know looked at that flower of life symbol myself at the Osirian and wondered about it, but there's no unfortunately there's just no way to know when it was put there. That's the problem. Yeah. And, 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 you know, even, even so, if it's got CNC machine technology, somebody would have had to bring that technology out there. They would have had to put it in the right place so it didn't look like it was artificially just stamped into something else. Um, and two, that technology has only been available for, you know, not that long. I mean, you know, it's a computer driven technology. So, um, yeah, but the, well, well, I, the, 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 anyway, I, I I think there are other ways to incise into stone that would kind of mimic this precision of a CNC machine. Um, yeah, it would be uh, you know I'm intending to go back with Annalise with my wife and and friends next year sometime to Egypt, and you know this would be a really interesting question to go to the Osirian, take some really really high uh, uh, high resolution photographs. And uh, even you know, get up close and personal with a with a uh, handheld microscope and get really close in to to that and just see you know whether whether there is any kind of possibility that it could have been created by some technology that um, that created that level of precision that we just don't know about. I would be interested. I, I think. Thank you for bringing this subject up, Paul, because I, I'm going to add it to my list of, of places to go next year when we, when we revisit Egypt. Well, make sure you put me on the list of people that you let know what you find. I will indeed. <laughs> of course I will. <laughs> and I'm going to make sure I get you those path technology books because Please, I, th yes. I think you're going to find them very well done and fascinating. They do sound fascinating. Um. What I'd love to hear from you are what are the key fundamental principles of sound that we should all understand so that we can functionally use sound in healthy ways in our lives and even understand some of the dangers of sound on our physical, emotional, sure. and mental well-being. You know, because sound is, as you know, I mean, nobody knows better than you. Sound sounds very simple, like sound. Yes, you can hear my voice, the music, the radio, the sound of a tree falling, but we know that Sound is, you know, the depth of sound is is phenomenal. And so I think most people's conception of sound, uh, you know, my listeners are pretty highly intelligent people, otherwise they wouldn't listen to a podcast like this. But <laughs> when we <laughs> when we look at things that I think people should know about sound, because either it can really help them use sound in ways that heal or help them understand 
what to avoid. Mm. Um, I think there's just a lack of explanation of things like that. So I'd love it if you can share some of the things that you think are really fundamental that we should all be aware of. I'd be happy to, Paul, yeah. Well, the first thing I think to say is that this to I'd like to blow out of the water this whole uh, terminology of sound wave. You know, it really disturbs me, this this term, which unfortunately we seem to be stuck with, don't we? You know, everyone talks about sound waves. They even talk about electromagnetic waves. And yet, if you were to say to someone, okay, so what's the shape of sound? And they would say, well, it's a, it's a wave, isn't it? And then you would say to them, okay, well, just show me this wave coming out of your mouth right now as you're speaking to me. Um, and they would show you literally a wiggle in the air. And this is what really disturbs me, you know, because it's this term that scientists have come up with, sound wave, which is really showing us a kind of, well, it's a misnomer. It's a misnaming of the form of energy. You know, what we, when we talk about sound waves, what we're really talking about is a graph. Um, and this yeah. is a graph of the energy. So sound, most sounds are based on simple harmonic motion. So if you take a pendulum, for example, and it swings backwards and forwards, it has a certain maximal excursion, doesn't it? You know, it goes to a certain swing point, and then it, it's what's called a stationary turning point in physics. It turns, literally changes direction after a moment of stillness, let's say, and goes back the other way. If you graph that motion, it will look like a what's termed a sine wave or sinusoidal wave. It definitely, that's a graph. It's a graph of the motion of that pendulum. Now, in the same way, if we talk about sound, we're talking about the exchange of frequency data between atoms or between molecules. Now, if you think of, the, uh, think of this in terms of the atomics, you have an atom that's vibrating in space at a certain temperature. So literally, the temperature, let's say the temperature in this room now is, I don't know, 75 degrees or something like that, Fahrenheit, right? So all the atoms in this room, all the molecules in this room, they're all vibrating in space at roughly that same temperature. Wherever you are in the room, it's 75 degrees. So, so the, all the atoms are vibrating at that, at that particular rate in space. But now let's give them another frequency. And let's say it's, it's the fundamental pitch of my voice which, you know, for argument's sake, is 150 hertz right now. So that all those atoms in the room now are vibrating in two different ways simultaneously. They're vibrating at their natural temperature, which, like I said, is, say, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very fast temperature, by the way, very fast vibration, I should say. But now we've given them a much slower vibration of 150 hertz, which is the fundamental frequency of my voice. In reality, of course, my voice is producing a huge range of frequencies, which give me my unique vocal, you know, quality. Sound. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's my unique voice, just as yeah. you have your own unique voice. These are all, um, you've got your fundamental frequency and then a whole range of harmonics at different amplitudes that give us our unique vocal characteristics. But let's try to keep this simple. Let's just think about these atoms vibrating in space with their natural temperature frequency and now the fundamental frequency of my voice, which I've given you know, arbitrarily at 150 hertz, right? So now we can visualize these atoms vibrating in space at 150 hertz. Now, when those atoms bump into their neighbors, they obviously pass on the vibrational data from one to the other. So the 150 hertz vibration of an atom or a molecule will collide with its neighbors and pass on that 150 hertz, which is basically a definition of sound. It's the passing on of uh, periodicities of one atom or one molecule to another. That's you know a basic definition of sound. And what happens is when these collisions occur, they don't occur in one dimension, of course, they're occurring in three dimensions all of the time. So instead of thinking about sound as a wave that's wiggling its way through the air, which is a complete misnomer, like I say, that is a graph. Nature does not use graphs. What happens in nature is 
that this these events, these sonic events, are happening in three dimensions. Therefore, sound is actually a spherical phenomenon. All audible sounds, let's say, I must qualify this, all audible sounds, all sounds audible to humans, that is, are happening in three dimensions and approximately spherically. So I use this word approximately because in reality, there's no such thing as a perfect sound bubble or a sphere. They're not actually perfectly spherical. I'm going to give you an example why sound is a bubble, but it's not perfectly spherical. Okay. So what happens is now I'm speaking and there's a sound bubble that's emerging from my mouth. At the same time, it's being joined by a secondary bubble that's coming from down my nostrils via my paranasal sinus cavities, which is also helping to color my unique voice. So if I block up my nose now, you can hear my voice has completely changed character, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, um, so now we've got, anyway, the combination of these two bubbles <clears throat> is, is literally standing in front of my mouth and now starting to expand away, of course, at the speed of sound. Now, about one or two milliseconds after this bubble forms in front of my mouth, it diffracts backwards. Why does that happen? Because there are diffractive reactions happening in all the trillions and trillions of air particles. You know, the atoms and the molecules of the gas that are right in front of me are starting to collide together, just like you would have a, a set of billiards or, you know, whatever, they're, they're literally jumping off each other, bouncing off each other in a myriad of directions simultaneously, and therefore creating a sound bubble now that's completely circular around my head, right? So the only difference is that the energy in the sound bubble that's in front of me, in the direction of propagation, in other words, is much more, is much more powerful, there's more acoustic energy in the bubble than there is in the sound bubble, part, part of the sound bubble that's behind me. And we know this is true. You know, if you're walking down a street and there's someone in front of you and they're having a, trying to hold a conversation with you, you know, but then they're pointing away from you, essentially, you can still hear them. But of course, it's much less, uh, qu it's quieter than it would be if you were literally standing in front of them, hearing their conversation. So basically, we have a sound bubble now that's completely surrounding our head. And, there, and then, of course, it's expanding at the rate of sound, the speed of sound. Now, what, so what's happening? Where is the sonic information in this bubble? Well, the sonic information is because the bubble is actually rhythmically expanding and contracting as it expands. So it's not just expanding at the speed of sound. It's also pulsating in and out. And it's that pulsation in and out, which, if we graph it, looks like a wave, even mm. though the actual space form of the energy is not a wave. It's really a bubble. So we shouldn't really be talking about sound waves. We should be talking about sound bubbles because that's what they are. But they're never perfectly spherical. The reason is because when this sound bubble emerges from your mouth and from your nose, it takes a finite amount of time for the bubble to diffract backwards and literally surround your head. So maybe two or three milliseconds pass by. And in that time, obviously, the shape of the bubble changes from being perfectly spherical to being slightly ovoid. You know, it's, so I would probably term it spheroidal, let's say, if that's a word. I'm not sure if it is a word. But anyway. We can make it one. Make it a word. Spheroidal. It's, yep. it, it's spheroidal. It's not perfectly spherical. But nevertheless, you know, it looks like a bubble. So let's just call it a sound bubble. And it's expanding at the speed of sound. And so that's the, the essence of uh, what sound is. Ex but the one part of that story, that, of course, that we haven't talked about yet is the electromagnetic component of the sound. Because... Before we get into yeah, that, can yeah. I ask you a couple of quick questions just because sure. they're pertinent here? Mm -hmm. um, two things. One is an observation. The other one's a question. I'll start with a question. Um, I'm, for the listener's sake, listening to you speak, it sounds like we're talking about one bubble, but isn't there just a continuous stream of bubbles? Because our sound is not continuous. We break between words, syllables. Oh, of course. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So I, it's I'm really like a stream of it's bubbles. A stream right? of bubbles, right? Exactly. It's like we're blowing bubbles, like a kid, you know, with his little stick blowing Bu- bubbles. Bubble blower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically, you know, if we could see sound around us, Paul, we would be immersed in a myriad of bubbles that'd be all around us all the time, and the, they would have a kind of kaleidoscopic. Um, beauty of the on their surfaces, you know, as they're expanding, because and this is another aspect to sound bubbles and sound in general is that all sounds are holographic. What this means is that the data at any point on the surface of the bubble is exactly the same vibrational data at any point inside the bubble. And this is a you know part of the definition of what holography is all about, right? Yeah. So it basically means if you take any one atom or any one molecule that's either on the surface of the bubble or inside the bubble, that one atom or that one molecule contains all of the vibrational data related, in this case, to my unique voice or to your unique voice. And don't you think that's an extraordinary thing to think of a single atom Okay, initially it's got its its temperature, whatever that is, and it's you know in some kind of terahertz frequency band, and then on the top of that, we're then adding a whole series of frequencies, the fundamental, all of the harmonics at different amplitudes, and this one atom is containing all of that data. I just think that's so beautiful. It's it so is ordinary. You, uh, you know what it brings up? I've seen. Um diagrams produced by John Archibald Wheeler, the famous quantum physicist who's not alive anymore, but you know who he was? I do, yeah. Yeah, he was Richard, one of Richard Feynman's mentors. And he diagrammed the, um, the event horizon of black holes. And it basically, as you're talking, I'm having this image of this event horizon showing how the bits of information are contained <clears throat> throughout the what would look like a membrane of a cell, but in the event horizon, and even Nassim Harriman uh, shows similar concepts in his work. So it's just interesting how there's this, I don't know what would the right word be, almost like a scaling effect. Yes. You know? Well, this is one of the wonderful things about nature, isn't it, Paul? You know, that that's very often scale is irrelevant. I've I've talked about this, you know, in some of my lectures, for example, where you know, the, on on the scale of cosmology, there are galaxy clusters that are seen in the in the heavens to be organized. And you know, there's a paper. One of the papers is called the Egg Carton Universe, for example, that shows these giant structures in the heavens. And the whole, you know, the whole theory behind this all comes back to sound. If we believe in the Big Bang, and uh, you know, some not not all scientists do. Um, but if we believe in that Big Bang theory, then when the matter from the singularity that, you know, Georges Lemaitre talked about, when the singularity began to expand for the first, according to the mathematical theory, for the first 370,000 years, the matter of the universe was so dense that sound was actually the most, the most powerful, the most potent force organizing principle in the cosmos just during those first 370,000 years. And then as the matter continued to expand, the quantum effects that had caused little irregularities, let's say, in the distribution of matter during those first very dense few hundred thousand years, those uh, singularity, sorry, those quantum effects continued even as the universe continued to expand, therefore showing us today the results, which are galaxy clusters here, galaxy clusters there, in a very, very organized fashion, as if somebody had literally, you know, planned it all out, sort of thing. So, but then on the other, uh, at the other end of the scale, if we come down to the planetary scale, there's a giant hexagon that you probably know about on the on the north pole of the planet Saturn. It's so yes. large it could swallow three Earths. Right, these are cymatic forces at work. So it looks like cymatic forces were at work in a, on a giant scale in the universe. Then coming to the planet Saturn, there are cymatic forces at work even today there, creating a, a giant hexagon. <clears throat> and then if you go to the moon, 
uh, our moon has, there are many craters that are hexagonal shaped. Did you know that on the moon? And the, I didn't know that. These are created when, you know, asteroid impacts, for example, occur under the right conditions. Of course, there's no, obviously no air, no atmosphere on the moon. It doesn't, but you don't need it. Because what happens is at the moment of the impact of the asteroid, the matter is so dense, right? That there really is sound because, again, it's a bit like what we're talking about, the beginning of the universe, if we believe that theory, you know, that the matter was so dense that sound can then travel through that matter. And in the case of these asteroid impacts on the moon, under certain conditions, that sound that's created during the impact literally organizes the matter into a cymatic pattern. Uh, you know, very large, obviously, but there are many craters on the moon that are uh, hexagonal shaped. And, um, and so it's this whole idea of scale with cymatics absolutely fascinates me. Because at the other end of the scale, in the microscopic realm, every cell in our bodies is exhibiting a cymatic pattern, you know, in the, in the tiny, tiny scale of cells. <clears throat> That's another subject that we can talk about in relation to healing, the healing principles of cymatics in our bodies. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure how familiar you are with minerals and trace minerals, but minerals are important to our body for many, many functions, and minerals and trace minerals also help regulate our hormonal system. And one of the products that I've been using for many years is Shilage Minerals. But when I got a hold of Shervin's Shilage from Symbiotica, it was a total notch above anything I've ever tried. So I've got Shervin here to tell us what's special about his Shilage and how to use it. You know, Sheila Jeet is, uh, you can pronounce it any way you want. I like Sheila Jeet. It makes me want to dance a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the actual product makes me want to dance. Good. I take it on the rise. You know, it's at the center point of Ayurveda. It's, you know, a collection of fulvic minerals, soil, decomposition of plant material. So you're getting all the minerals and it, you're getting it the way Mother Earth provided it and the right. way we can absorb it. And so the way I look at that, it's instant energy and it reduces acidosis across the body. So if you want to reduce and chelate acids out of the body, Shilajit is pretty much the answer and the solution to that. And, you know, it's probably our best seller right now. Everybody's, you know, doing rituals with it on the rise and they're using it throughout the day. It makes for a really good, you know, tonic. It's delicious. Once your body starts getting acclimated to it, the flavor starts to kick in. And, you know, if you're a coffee drinker, if you're a matcha drinker, if you're a tea drinker, this is a really good balancer to keep your body nourished of what you need. Because most people drinking coffee, yes. they're pouring acids and already in it, on, onto an already acidic body. This is a good way to balance that out through the minerals. And if you're not eating certified organic food from good soils, you're eating mineral deficient food. And the minerals in Sheila J are very important for our skin, our nails, and our hair, which a lot of people have problems with. So I think this is a great product across the board for anybody. And our jing, right? So we are mineral deficient. Yeah. Our foods have been dilapidated, right? It's yes. like Franken foods, right? Shilajit is mineralizing you to the blood, to yep. the bone. And if you're a man, you're really going to feel it, let me tell you. Yeah, well, good. I'm sure the <laughs> women will like that. So um, get your jing yes. with your Shilajit. And Jing, you know, that means your, your juice, your life force, boys. And uh, the nice thing about Shilly Jay is it does not take much at all. No. Uh, a serving is tiny. It's very potent stuff. So it's not like you have to use a lot. It'll last you for quite a while. So go to Symbiotica, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com. And on checkout, to get your 15% discount, use the code CHECK15, all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 and remember, check out all their other products because your discount works right across the board. Enjoy. Uh, there's another thing I wanted to bring up, but but you brought up something in my mind. Now, I wish I knew the exact details, but I wouldn't doubt if you know what I'm going to refer to here. There was something that the uh, astronauts did or NASA did. I don't know if it, if it was with a... Um, I think it was maybe with a satellite where they dropped something and it hit the moon and they found something shocking that the moon rang like a bell for a long time. Yeah, it's very well known that uh, that the moon has inherent resonances, you know, but but so all planets do. Well, I'm saying all planets is uh, the, all solid bodies, you know, have a certain 
resonance because the, any sound will ricoch ricochet around inside the solid body. Um, you know, seismographs on Earth are measuring these kind of vibrations in the Earth all of the time. And so that's not really, it doesn't astonish me that the moon rings like a bell. Um, I, I would be surprised if it didn't, being a rocky body. Yeah, um, I think what was so surprising is the consistency of the ring um, has led to a theory that maybe the moon is actually something that's been constructed by uh, other intelligences because the ring on it was was really more like a bell than a, a ball of rock. Yeah, uh, from... I've read that. You know, and who knows? I mean, my goodness, it's actually it's actually possible. It's even possible because um, one of the things that really bothers me, you know, as a scientist about the moon is this business of it being just the right distance from Earth and just the right diameter to just cover the disk of the sun, you know. Uh, yes. And if it wasn't for that, if, the, if, if those distances were different, if the diameter was different or whatever, or, or even if its mass was different, it wouldn't be at that orbital distance and it wouldn't cover the disk of the sun. It would either partially cover it or it would completely black it out during a solar eclipse. And yeah. If that was the case then we wouldn't have learned all that we've learned. For example, you know, the Einstein experiment about the, 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 the bending of light, you know, when it passes, skin, skims by the sun. Uh, right, you know, that the gravitational effect. Yeah, and many others would never have been discovered if, if the moon had been at a different distance or different diameter. So it kind of bothers me, this coincidence, you know, is it a coincidence or, or has it been plan somehow you know so yeah I, i'm open to it i'm open yeah there's so damn many mysteries it's like you're gonna have to be reincarnated <laughs> a thousand times to finish the expedition you i know? know but isn't it wonderful paul I mean, it is yeah yeah what else is there to do <laughs> these mysteries <laughs> yeah i find these things fascinating sometimes i've i've meditated for multiple years holding the question like what is love or what is consciousness or what is god you know most people just don't have the patience for that. But personally, I find that, you know, something like that haunts my soul. I, I just wow. I, I, I just have this detective in me that has to figure shit out or it drives me absolutely nutty. Well, you know, join the club. You know, I'm with you all, not all the way, Paul. And, um, you know, a lot of scientists, you know, that I think perhaps some scientists anyway would just say, oh, it's just a coincidence that the moon is that distance, it's that size and so on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah well it's possible it is a coincidence but my god it's a heck of a coincidence <laughs> well you know like einstein said absence of proof is not proof of absence so exactly. i think unfortunately people use coincidence and when they should be saying i'm just too lazy to figure it out yeah well one of the uh, just before we move on just just while it's in my mind you know one of the these this aspect of coincidence that really um i find intriguing are the, are the Cymoglyphs that I've created with the cymoscope instrument of what appear to be early life forms. You've probably seen them, you know, yeah. on our website. Uh -huh. and, you know, so when I first started seeing those many years ago, when I first started working with water as the revealing medium, and one day, you know, in the lab, I would be working with some frequency or other, uh, in, uh, injecting it into the water, and suddenly what appeared to be a trilobite was staring me in the face. You yes, know, this trilobite was like rock steady in the water. It wasn't going anywhere. It was perfectly, you know, just staring at me. And I took a photograph, obviously, and I thought, I scratched my head. I thought, wow, how the heck is that? You know, how can you create something in water that so strongly resembles a trilobite? But obviously, you know, when that very first image occurred all those years ago, um, I just dismissed it as a, just as we're saying, you know, it's oh, just one of those things, just a coincidence. But then, you know, as the years went, went by, I never, never really actively went, went to try and create any of these images. They just popped up naturally through doing other experiments for other reasons, other purposes. And then suddenly there would be, you know, one of a starfish. It would be a starfish that would suddenly appear, you know, or some diatom would appear in the, in the water. And so I just kept on keep building a library of these images that resembled early life forms. And so my question really is to you, to myself, to, you know, everyone uh, listening to this, 
how many of these images would you have to have before you would not dismiss it as coincidence? That's the question. You know, <laughs> for me, it, it, I, I look at it, and if I have a question like that, I just go into meditation and say to my soul, "Is this true? And if it is true, where can I learn more about it?" But I, you know, I think that's what makes us all unique because you know, like. In certain areas, you're going to have a level of skepticism. See, for example, when, from all the stuff I've looked at on the flower of life patterns and all the Egypt experts and uh, engineers I've studied, I have no problem with the concept, uh, not only of the fact that I'm a remote viewer and I've ran into ETs and talked to them in many different dimensions throughout our own solar system and on our sun, I have no problem with the concept of extraterrestrial intelligence being involved in the pyramids, but you know, for your own reasons and from your own perspective and your own experience, you have a level of skepticism that makes your position unique. And I think we need that diversity so that we don't just deceive ourselves because a guy like you can make me think careful <laughs> and, 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 and I can say something to you that might trigger a, 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 a new way of perceiving something that might send you off on a new investigation or connect some dots. Yeah. You know, so I think it, it's pretty wild, you know, it's, of course it is. You know, if you, I think, you know, one of the things I, I don't have a, a problem with the, the poss possibility that the earth has been visited by alien civilizations. You know, I, I would love to think that. And I've been a great fan of science fiction all of my life. Actually, I, I really, you know, soak it up. I, I love that concept. I'd love to see the evidence for it, obviously. And I have seen some quite persuasive um, things over the years. That, uh, uh, like, for example, not long ago, well, what is it? it? must be two years now, actually. We went to a conference in South Africa. And Elise and I were invited by Michael Tellinger, and, uh, a very brilliant man. You probably know him. And I've heard he, of him, man. Yeah. yeah, Michael Tellinger had invited a whole stack of people to this conference, and you know we were one of them, and we were two of them. <laughs> and uh, and also there was a guy called Robert Salas, who had been an army officer, and we we actually were very fortunate to spend a couple of hours in the car with Robert, even before we heard his talk in South Africa. But one of the one of the aspects to his his story was that he'd been an army officer in the U.S. Uh, looking after silos, missile silos, and there was a day when UFOs uh, appeared above the silos, and the whole what made this so persuasive was he had all of the evidence. You know, he had documentary evidence. He had photographic evidence. He had, uh, t well, not, what are they called? Um, he had uh, telephone recordings, you know, everything, all of the evidence that, that you could possibly want to substantiate his story, that these, these UFOs had disabled all of the electronics in all of these silos and then just vanished, right, as fast as they came. And, and there's several cases of that. Oh yeah, several cases. You know, so so I mean, w w when you hear stories like that, you, know, you just can't dismiss them. You know, I mean, it's, no. it was so powerful. So I'm I'm completely open to the idea that the Earth has been visited. But in in the case of the Egyptian pyramids, the, I know that they were built to you know pretty high levels of precision for the for their day for sure. But when you look really really closely at the blocks and how they were laid, you think. Well, if they had high technologies, they just wouldn't be so crude. You know, it would be precision engineering all the way through, and it's not, you know. So mm -hmm. that's why I have this big problem. If you look at the casing stone, not the casing stone, if you look at the stones in the... Um, Foundation? No, I was going to say in the king's chamber, right? Oh, uh, Okay, yeah. the face of the stones. Let's take about, talk about the the blocks that cover the king's chamber. Those blocks... If you look at the face of them, they're beautifully flat. You know, I wouldn't call them polished, but I would certainly say they've been they've been uh, engineered to a very high standard of flatness. In fact, you can take an engineering what they call a flat and put it on any of those stones in the king's chamber, and you will see a beautiful level of precision there, really beautifully done. I mean, how the heck they managed to achieve that is beyond me. But 
if you then go into the relieving chambers above the king's chamber and you look at the back side of those stones, right? Oh my God, what a mess. They are all <laughs> raggedy and, you know, they haven't spent any time whatsoever, you know, on the backside. Why? Because they were never going to be seen. And this, yeah. is, this is what I mean about you getting into the mindset of these engineers. They, what was not going to be seen was not important to them. They would leave it rough, right? Just as they have for all the, all the uh, core blocks in the pyramid. No need to make them nice and clean, you know, right angles or whatever. Just leave them rough, guys, you know. Nobody's ever going to see them. And this is what I mean. If, there were, if, there were, if it was high technologies, you know, from the ancient Egyptians themselves or from some, you know, uh, extraterrestrial beings, they wouldn't have left them like that. If we were going to build something today, uh, like a king's chamber, uh, and we're going to, you know, top it off with granite, granite blocks, we wouldn't leave the backside all higgledy-piggledy. We'd, we'd cut the thing with, with you know, with high-precision uh, diamond cut diamond drills and diamond saws. You know, we wouldn't leave it like that. It's this difference in mindset that really puzzles me, you know, when people think that the pyramids were built by some high technology. I just don't see it. Well, you know, the one thing that comes into my mind, and then I'll jump to the other thought I wanted to share. Uh, the one thing that comes into my mind is that if you had a bunch of people that were, shall we say, the workforce, but you had higher levels of intelligence as the um, foreman of the project, yeah. then you might have a marriage of two levels of technology. One, the engineering, the blueprint makers, and those do doing the grunt work. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, we know about um, the, the workforce, of course, from Mark Lehner's wonderful work. You know, he's been there at Giza, I think, most of his life, actually. And, you know, studying the village that was right beside the the Wall of the Crow, you know, where they had this workman's village where the, all these guys lived, not just, you know, not just guys, but lived with their families, with their children, you know, because they were, they spend a whole lifetime working yeah. on monuments. So it's, it's great to get that kind of insight into how they lived as well as how they worked. Yeah, the last comment that I wanted to share before we shift here is I think one of the possibilities for so many people conceiving a sound as a wave is one of the things that I've noticed. Um, one, I've got your cymoscope, as you know, and playing with it, you put sand on there, and as you're changing frequencies, all of a sudden you see a wave like movement through yeah. the medium. Yes. Two, I've put water in Tibetan bowls many times as part of healing ceremonies. And when you strike the bowl, the waves, the waves appear across the uh, water. Yes. And, and so uh, when you're looking at that, and then also when you pluck a guitar string, it moves in a wave and produces sound. So I think maybe <laughs> it's the observation of the effects of sound that have left people thinking of sound as a wave is oh, just you're a absolute, thought. You're absolutely right, Paul. Um, by the way, it's a Sima plate that you have, not a Sima. Okay. Um, right. Your your scope is is the one that produces images, right? Yeah, with water. Yeah. Um, yeah. The difference is in one of the one of the famous physics experiments called a Kuntz tube, K U N D T S. Um, that that really didn't help the whole story of the of the wave phenomenon, you know, because what happens is in a Kuntz tube, you have a, a transducer, you know, some little speaker at one end of the tube. Actually, the original one just had a tuning fork in the original experiment. Um, but but nowadays, you know, the, this experiment that's shown in physics labs, you know, physics classrooms, I should say, um, it usually has a little speaker at one end. And then you have this tube um, of a certain length, and you can vary the length by a piston at one end, the other end. And then you put some powder, like, you know, talcum powder or some other very fine powder into the tube. And then when you make sound from the speaker, at certain frequencies, you get what's 
termed a standing wave, right? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Where where the energy the, the wavelength of the energy just happens to fit perfectly at a certain frequency, and then what you see is it disturbs the powder into a wave like uh, shape. So literally, grains are uh, in some cases creating like um, antinodal areas and where there's literally a peak of pressure in the tube, and then other areas, nodal areas, where there's minimal vibration in the tube therefore the powder is hardly affected at all and then obviously it all points in between because this is sinusoidal sound we're talking about therefore you get this beautiful arrangement of a little you know talcum powder grains or whatever the powder is that's used and creates this wave in the powder but that doesn't mean that the sound is a wave it means that the sound is interacting with matter and causing the matter to look like a wave, just as it does in water. You know, in the cymoscope instrument, for example, what happens is when we inject sound into the water, and this is pure medical-grade water, very, very pure water, the kind of water you can safely inject into your veins, basically. It's very, very pure. When you inject sound into the water, yes, of course, you get little... Uh, ripples on the surface of the water, what we talk about is that the sonic periodicities uh, have been transposed or transformed to become water wavelet periodicity. So we're creating a model of the sound in the water created by these little wavelets, right? And by the way, it's the pattern is not just on the surface of the water. This pattern goes into the depths of the water. So in the moment when the sound enters into the water, um, it's organizing not only the surface pattern, if you like, but also all the trillions and trillions of molecules under the water surface are also organized in a blink of an eye into a beautiful organization. And you know this is true because when you look through a, a, a camera into the water, what you see is organization not only on the surface but into the depths as well with different focal points showing us different organizational levels into the depths of the water. This is because the refractive index of water is changed ever so slightly by the pressure of the sound as it's organizing in, you know, like I say, the antinodal areas and the nodal areas, creating slightly different refractive indices which then show up in the photograph. So you end up seeing you know, great depth in the water. But all of these effects, you know, are, I know (laughs) they are very um, persuasive in making us think that sound is a wave, but it really is not a wave. Yes, when it interacts with matter, it can create wave-like disturbances for sure, but it's definitely not a wave. Uh, You know, you can, it's, this is not my science, by the way, you know, I mean, uh, it's, this has been known for a hundred years or more that sound is spherical. It's just that it's not talked about in those terms. It's still talked about as a wave, and uh, it does bother me. It, it, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, I just live with it. I think because most of you know because we can't see sound unless you have an instrument like your own. I think where a lot of the problem comes from is because most of the education we get on sound is in schools where they're putting graphs on the board. Exactly. So we we begin to associate the image on the board with what we think of as the reality of what Correct. we're talking about. Correct. And so I think it's just a, a sort of a natural human tendency that without scientific training to make that m- mistake. I, I agree with you entirely. But I also think that there is um, some possibility that even physicists can be led astray by this misnaming, by this model, Um, you know, showing drawings, showing diagrams of atomic physics with wiggles on paper. These wiggles on paper that are meant to meant to graphically represent the form of energy that's, you know, uh, happening in at some in some atomic physics lab, for example. But in reality, there are no wiggles of these particles. These particles are not wiggling, right? So it 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 really disturbs me to the point where I think it's possible that some errors can be made in the conclusions drawn from certain experiments, like the double slit as a, as a prime example. 
you know, um, where I have huge disagreements with, with the results. So I, it does bother me. And it's not just a question of naming or misnaming something. I really think that there's a, a, a real potential here for misunderstanding at certain levels of physics. Well, what's coming to my mind is that you have disagreements in such important areas. I'm going to need to do about five podcasts with you to explore <laughs> these things. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I imagine some of you are finding that your mind is not as sharp as it was, or that you can't seem to remember things as well, such as the last page you read in the book, or the key points from a meeting you just attended recently. Do you feel that your brain is taking longer to come online, or that your thinking gets muddled or fuzzy when you've got a lot to get done? If so, Organifi Pure may be just the magic you need. A key ingredient in Organifi Pure, called Neurofactor, showed a significant impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor, which has been widely reported to play a critical role in neuronal development, maintenance, repair, and protection against neurodegeneration. The certified organic combination of herbs in Organifi Pure not only enhances mental clarity and promotes brain-derived neurotropic factor to stimulate the development of new neural pathways, it aids in enhanced digestion, which is important because many cognitive problems are symptoms of poor digestion. To get your Organifi Pure, go to organifi.com forward slash check 20. That's organifi.com forward slash check 20. Get 20% off with your promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's capitals, check 20. Enjoy Organifi Pure. One of the things that came to my mind, I just didn't want to interject while you were talking, when I studied the history of cymatics on your website, there was a lady that made her own little sound voice activated device. She was friends with um, Faraday, if I remember right. Are you talking about Margaret Watts Hughes? It was, one, it was a woman and she was from the you know early 1900s it showed pictures of her wearing a long dress and yeah, showed all the issues, yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so i actually did research once i found out about her from your website i started researching the internet and i found um articles on her work and and she they showed many of the pictures that she produced with her voice that looked like trees and flowers and grass and like she was producing these these cymatic images with her little handmade device that were were really amazing because she was actually, I mean, you could literally have thought those were pictures of someone's backyard or something. Yeah, but they weren't scientific though. Let's be honest. I mean, you know, I, I've got a, a lot of respect for Margaret Watts you. She was certainly a pioneer, but there's some misunderstandings, you know, concerning her imagery here. But one of the devices that she created. That is for sure, you know, something that's valuable from a scientific perspective is a little sounding device that she called the Ida, Ida phone, wasn't it? Ida phone, I think. Yes, the Ida phone. Yeah. Ida phone, yeah. So basically, it's a, a resonating chamber over which she stretched a membrane, maybe latex, yep. for example, uh -huh. uh, weighted evenly around the outside, you know, to give it an even tension. Um, and then she would have a, a long tube, which was for all the world looking a little bit like a didgeridoo, something right. you could basically make sound into that would send sound down into the resonating chamber. And then she would sprinkle on, you know, some uh, particulate matter on the membrane and therefore make that sound visible. Now, one of the aspects to this, you know, from a scientific viewpoint, is that when you make sound visible in, in those ways, it's very, very difficult to separate the resonances, the natural inherent resonances in the membrane from the actual uh, geometric effects that would happen on the membrane if, you, if it was not for those natural resonances. So it's quite difficult to, to separate them. Nevertheless, it is a valuable uh, scientific tool that she invented uh, and and used as a basic means of studying sound and music. You know, she was a vocalist, so she yes. she sang into it, and she created probably the first um, cymatic stave. You know, where you're literally creating cymatic patterns and putting it instead of instead of putting musical notes on the paper, she was 
you know, literally putting a cymatic stave on the paper, cymatic images. But anyway, uh, the part that you're talking about, where you see what look like trees and ferns and all of those, they are taking a leaf, if I can use that term, that's a, that's a good pun, it's taking a leaf out of Michael Faraday's work, right? Ah. Um, because Michael Faraday and indeed Margaret Watts use, use, used liquids like with a, on a glass plate that she then moved physically with her hands, right, as the vibrations were imprinting. So in other words, kind of creating multi, um, multi-images from the one image and there, uh. therefore creating some fantastic uh, visual effects, but really not what you would term science. It's a bit like, you know, if we took a cymoglyph today, for example, from the cymoscope instrument, and then we put it into Photoshop and then applied a kaleidoscopic effect to it, say, you know, which we can do quite easily in Photoshop, you end up with something that's kind of, well, it's not the original, is it? You know, we've added, no. we've added a special effect to it. So mm-hmm. from a scientific viewpoint, we've corrupted it, we could say. Yeah. And in a similar way, what she was doing was really art. It wasn't science. She was creating beautiful pieces of art, which we should not, you know, in any way denigrate because it was, she was a, a pioneer. Um, she created what had never been created before. But, you know, how much value is it from a scientific viewpoint versus if we can weigh it up against the artistic content? I would say most of what she created was um, was valuable from an art point of view, and uh, but perhaps not from a scientific viewpoint. You know, that's what I would. Yeah, well, that's interesting because I didn't know about that because the way the article, the the der- various articles, and I even watched some videos uh, on YouTube. If you search her name on YouTube, you can actually see some videos about her and her work. So the the thing that it left me with, which I've, I got left with looking at your work as well. When you're looking at diatomes and trilobites and things like that, (laughs) I just, uh, it made me think, wow, you know, it's a real good example of the formative forces of sound in nature. It is. Uh, It's also, it's also what it is showing us, you know, is that sound can indeed be used as an art form. It doesn't have to be purely science all the time. Why can we not use sound as an art form? And indeed we are. You know, it is it is being used as an art form. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, as long as we, we are clear on what we're looking at is either art or science. We have to, you know, just use our own common sense, you know, to know that w- what we're looking at is either has scientific value or it is of artistic value. Well, yes, and that brings us to a metaphysical question, and that is, is whatever people call God or source a scientist or an artist? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. Oh, my God. Well, I would say both, actually. You know, looking, Well, me too, looking, <laughs> because looking into here the heart, we all are. <laughs> yeah, looking into the heart of a flower, you know, oh, my goodness, you know, there's such beauty and such organization we see, you know, we see great science, we see great art all merged together, all melded together. Well, John, you know, we've been going for a couple of hours and I have a lot of amazing <laughs> questions and dialogue points. So um, I'm totally up for continuing this and, uh, you know, working our way through these because I think these are all very important discussions for people. But before we leave people with a, a big cliffhanger in the beginning of the uh, dialogue. We we were talking about images on your website, and we didn't want to let the cat out of the bag. But we've we've just got so into so many things, we've never really made it there. So, <laughs> what we were talking about was the cymographic uh, or, or the cymatic images of the sun and other stars that you yeah. have captured. So, um, and I know you've got beautiful pictures of them on your website, and you've got posters that people can buy. Indeed, some. Could you just, in closing, maybe just give us a little bit about how those images got made, um, maybe what they represent to you, and then where people can go see them? Sure, I'd be very happy to. I think, you know, the first thing to say here is just let's talk very briefly about the cymoscope instrument itself and what makes that different 
to you know all other cymatic devices that are currently available in the world. So with the cymoscope, I think I mentioned just a little while ago there that inherent resonances in any system unfortunately have this effect of let's use the word coloring you know not not color in the sense of of light color but just making filtering basically the results that you get from any result so in other words inherent resonances in the system can change the result in the cymoscope instrument like any physical object it has a whole set of its own natural resonances the big difference is with the cymoscope instrument, all of those inherent natural resonances have been identified and tuned out. So we tune them out with normal electronic filtering. Now, first of all, they are identified with an accelerometer system, conventional accelerometer system. So we know where all the resonances are, and then we literally tune them out. We remove them so that when we put a sound into the cymoscope, we know that the model of sound that we're going to see in terms of a, a cymoglyph, you know, a cymatic pattern, we know that that model, you can hang your hat on it. It's basically, you know, rep reproducible. Put the same signal in, you'll get the same result. And that is an accurate, accurate model of the sound that you have put, you've injected into the cymoscope. So we've made that sound visible and we can actually throw mathematics at it, we can analyze it, you know, and we can deal with that from a scientific perspective. So several years ago, we were contacted by the Smithsonian in the US who wanted to make visible the sounds of stars. Now, some, some listeners might say, well, how, can the heck, how the heck can you have sounds of stars, you know, when there's a vacuum in space? Well, of course, sound cannot travel in a vacuum, that's for sure. But because stars contain obviously trillions and trillions and trillions of tons of, of matter that's in vibration, then of course all these stars contain sounds. And these sounds in the atomic furnace of the star can help astroseismologists, which is a, a branch of astrophysics, can help these scientists understand the atomic processes that are going on inside the star. So the way that they do that is basically to monitor the light of the star, and that light will have a tiny, tiny fluctuation in it, invisible to the unaided eye, but to the very sensitive instrumentation, the light has a little modulation in it, and that modulation can be demodulated effectively to sonify, to make audible the sounds that are happening in the heart of the star. So that's the, the basic principle. So the Smithsonian contacted us and said, look, we're going to put on an exhibition of uh, star sounds uh, made visible, and can you help us? So I was delighted to you know, be able to, um, to take on that commission. So in essence, what we did was a number of astronomers around the world sent us sound files that they had created from these from starlight basically that's been demodulated creating these uh, sonified versions of that energy in the star and then we injected them into the cymoscope instrument one by one and made visible the sounds of these stars and actually there's some you know scientific value for this it's not just a question of art here we are creating a form of art of course this is sound art you could call it um, but we're also creating models that can be used mathematically, you know, to help the, the scientists in this case unravel the mystery of what's going on inside the star. And in our case, we um, we decided to m actually make some of these available as posters and sell them on our uh, in our web sh web shop. Why? <laughs> because as I mentioned, you know, right at the outset, we are a self funded lab and we do need you know, an income stream. And uh, and many people find these posters very attractive. You know, they're beautiful. They are. To see the sounds of, of, a, of our own sun made visible, for example, um, it's fabulous, you know. And so people can um, download the image and then um, either print it out themselves or on our website, we have various options where you can print them 
at various sizes, you know, so that you, there's various ways to buy them, basically. But the essence of it is that you end up with a beautiful piece of art that actually represents accurately the sound of that star made visible. And I, I think it's a fabulous uh, marriage between science and art. So I'm, I'm grateful to you, Paul, you know, for bringing that up. So thank you very much. I, I'm very grateful for you for doing it. And, and I'm going to just throw a quick closing comment in here. You know, from a spiritual or a metaphysical or a mystical perspective, when I look at those images, you know, like if someone said to me, hey, Paul, I listened to your podcast with John Stuart Reed. Who is he? If I could open a book and say, well, here's a picture of him. I really enjoy this guy. You know, he's a he's a really smart guy and I love talking to him. They would have a sense of knowing you far better than if I just described you with words. And so when I look at those images that you've created from the stars, it's almost like I'm looking at the face or the image or the presence of the being or the beingness or what you know, the Greeks might have called the physical manifestation of the entelechy or the organizing intelligence Mm. of the star. So I feel like, just like I have a picture, I have pictures in my office of Carl Jung, David Bohm, um, Gene Gebser, uh, Itzhak Bentov, uh, Arthur M. Young, Houston Smith, Paramahansa Yogananda. I've got sculptures. I surround myself with the images of the people that inspire me to be the best I can be in the world. And so when I look at the pictures of the stars, knowing that our life could not exist without the sun, and that if you think of it as a formative force or a cosmic intelligence, to have a picture of the cymoglyph of the sun is just like having a picture of somebody that I want to honor, love, and respect for the gifts they've given my life. So for me, when I saw those yeah, when I saw those pictures, I thought, wow, I can I can actually now have a a representation of beings that have impacted my life. And I think for, if someone's got more of a spiritual orientation or they study Steiner and realize that there's intelligence within stars, um, then those pictures actually become, um, shall we say, something to put on your altar. Wow, Paul, thank you so much for those sharing those beautiful thoughts. And you know, looking at the at the image of the the cymoglyph of the sun made visible, if you study it closely, you'll see what looked like on the on the interior part of that cymoglyph. You see what looked like solar prominences and magnetic field lines, and it it really is an intriguing, really intriguing image, actually. So I'm very grateful to you uh, mentioning what you you know you just shared there. It's Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And by the way, you know, I too surround myself with my heroes. You know, I've got uh, Michael Faraday looking over one shoulder. I've got Einstein looking over another shoulder. I've got yeah. um, um, James Clark Maxwell looking over another shoulder. <laughs> I've got, I've got uh, right to my left. I've got a, a sculpture of Einstein. My mother's a very successful sculptor, so. She gave me a sculpture of Albert Einstein. I've got the Dalai Lama. I've got many. I got like uh, 20, I don't know, maybe 15. I don't know how many. I haven't counted them all, but my mom's done 24 of the world's greatest peacekeepers. Wow. Fabulous. Yeah. But we forgot to say where, what your website URL is so people can get there. Okay. Well, we've got two. We've got the, the research uh, site, which is Cymoscope, C-Y-M-A, and then scope, like microscope, dot com. So cymoscope.com. And then our other uh, website is soundmadevisible.com. So no spaces, no, no, I mean, just sound made visible, all one word, dot com. And that's, that's basically our shop, Paul. That's where we okay. sell our posters and, you know, and uh, cymatic devices and other, other materials. So, yeah, I'm very, very grateful, uh, you know, to have had this chat with you today. I think we've had a fabulous conversation. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's let's do it again. I'll, I'll send you an invitation. Um, I'm going to keep all the remaining questions because we got to number three out of fifteen. So, oh my god, I think you and I have uh, a lot to share, and I'm sure that the listeners would probably find your answers to the other questions quite profound because I specifically chose them 
based on trying to impart your knowledge to the world to help people understand important things better. Thank you so much, um, Paul. So, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you to the sponsors for your love and support and for producing such beautiful, sustainable products to help us all live and love more fully. Thank you to all the listeners for your uh, willingness to engage education and be vehicles for change and higher consciousness in the world. Thank you for sharing the podcast with everybody. Remember my rule, if you love it, share it. If you didn't, it's our secret. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, I look forward to sharing more with all of you and sharing more of John Stuart Reed because you just got a, just a small touch of this guy. I mean, I started reading his stuff and went, okay, I got I to gotta become a tick and get some of his blood, <laughs> you know, and uh, fortunately he donated some to me for my new book. So uh, you'll get to see more of John Stuart Reed's uh, wisdom in my upcoming new book. So John, thank you very much. I really look forward to thank our next know. opportunity to, to have a, a great share and dialogue. And I uh, encourage all of you to go check out his website. There's just some amazing stuff there. And thank you for all the great work you're doing in the world, John. I think you're really helping evolve us in many ways. You're very, very, very gracious. Thank you so much, Paul, and uh, many blessings to you. All right, guys. Thank you, everybody. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, John Stuart Reed. John has a new online course, Explore the Secrets of Sonic Science and Cymatics, Musical Medicine for Radiant Healing, which is recommended by Paul for deeper study into the topics he and John discussed in this episode. Go to bit.ly forward slash sonic dash science to find out more and register for the course. That's bit.ly forward slash sonic dash science. To find out more about the Cymoscope, John's invention that makes sound visible, visit sonic-age.com. That's S-O-N-I-C-A-G-E.com. You can follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at czechinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.